But then there was a 911 call 12 days before the shooting death of Ahmaud Arbery. And it was at night. And that call was made by one of the defendants. And police responded. And that response by police was all captured on body cam. The jury saw it. Take a look. We don't see him back there unless he jumped the fence this way or... And Travis just walked down there. He's going in from our backyard and going to check back this way. Okay. Uh, he's armed, by the way. So okay. Uh, I think all our guys are walking. Uh, yeah. well, he said he had, I think he said he red shorts and, and a white shirt. Sure, no, a I wonder if it's the same guy if he's got the sleeve. Okay, so he, Travis actually saw him? Yeah, he said he turned around right here and put the lights on him. He said when the lights hit him, he hauled ass inside the house. And all the times on the video that Mr. English just sent me, he's sending me one now, it's always been just in there plundering around. He hasn't seen him actually take anything. Mm -hmm. I said, so, you know. It's criminal trespass. Yeah, 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 very least. So, well, ordering and prowling. Stolen. I had it reported and stolen yeah. on the first right down the road. Um, now, we did have, um, I took a report down the road here, the house on the corner, the guy where the Jeep and all is, he had some stuff stolen of some guns stolen, but we got on video the car that people had come in and stole them. They were from another neighborhood. Okay, did you hear that? The, the, the owner of the home under construction was saying he never saw him take anything, and the McMichaels there are hearing that from the officer on the body cam. Well, that officer testified today and, and talked about um, explaining trespass versus burglary and, and, and what has to happen. Take a listen. What did you tell Larry English about how you trespass somebody from a property? We docu we once we make contact with the person on the property, we explain to them that the homeowner, find out who they are, we identify them. The homeowner does not want them there. He has no legal reason to be there. And the, the property owner then we put them on, the way I do it is I put them on speaker, if they're not there in person, I put them on speakerphone. And I would say, Mr. English, I'm here with whoever the person is. So you're saying they have no right to be here and you don't want them here on the property. And he would say that so they could be heard. And we would document it in our computer system. So if that person was ever back on the property and I explained to that person if you ever come back on this property for any reason whatsoever, uninvited, you will automatically be arrested for trespassing. Okay. And you told that to Mr. English that that was yes. your standard procedure? Yes. Okay. And not speculation, but was that your intent if you encountered this young black male? Yes, to find out who he is, identify him, why he was coming up there late at night, and then ultimately it's Mr. English's decision if he wanted him trespassed or not. This is a big issue, and, and, and this is a really a big moment in this case because it's all about the citizen's arrest or the alleged citizen's arrest. Is that a valid basis for the actions of the McMichaels that day in pursuing Ahmad Arbery through the neighborhood? What was he doing in, in, in that home? Did they have knowledge that it was just a trespass? Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae, who's in Brunswick, Georgia tonight. This is, the, the more we talk about it, the more confusing it gets, and sometimes confusion helps uh, criminal defendants in cases. Uh, but exactly where are we on this issue of citizen's arrest based upon uh, what we heard today and what this jury has heard so far and what the defense is doing? Vinny, the requirement under the Georgia statute for citizen's arrest, which is now repealed, but was in effect when that video that we just played was shown and on the day that Ahmaud Arbery was killed, it requires that the person who is trying to carry out the citizen's arrest have immediate knowledge or see it in their presence, this felony that's being committed. So what we have here on February 11th into the 12th in the wee hours of the morning of 2020, this is before Amont Arbery encounters the McMichaels in that chase. Uh, so this is back just 12 days before, and it's so similar, the more I watch this video, of what's going on outside in the neighborhood. They are 
it, talking to police the way they were on the day that this incident happened, the shooting incident, you hear Gregory McMichael really taking charge of telling police what happened, even though it was his son who initially saw Ahmaud Arbery. And you even hear Gregory McMichael using the same words, saying, quote, he was hauling ass. That's something that he used to describe Ahmaud Arbery going into this house that night on February 11th. And then he used it again when he's telling police why he decided to chase Arbery on February 23rd, 2020. So a lot of uh, things that the defense used uh, as far as the cross-examination of this witness, Officer Rash, to show that this was their knowledge. They understood that this was someone who was committing a crime, but the prosecution uh, hammering home today that this officer told them that he was not guilty of a felony at that point. There was no burglary because nothing was stolen that they could find. Okay, so, so where is it left now? So it's left with the McMichaels on the 11th, because me... From my perspective, this is a key, key day. Was the defense able to, um, through cross-examination or any other way, establish that there was a felony or that the McMichaels, at that night, with the interaction with police, were left um, thinking that there was somehow, some way, a, a felony taking place through the actions of Ahmaud Arbery that night or any other night? What they were able to establish is that the McMichaels were aware that there were items that were stolen, uh, items that we learned today is a microphone system, a satellite system, and a Yeti cooler, but that it was not the officer who told them that Arbery may have been the one who stole them. Uh, really, the defense, the way that they tried to establish the fact that this is still a possibility that their clients had uh, the state of mind of there being a felony underway, is that there was no conclusion. This was still an out standing investigation. The police still wanted to know who stole the items. They didn't see Arbery do it, but they also didn't see anyone else who went into that house do it. And Officer Rash did say that it was his understanding that these items were stolen from a boat on that property during this time period that you're seeing people going in and out on surveillance video. Okay, I want to bring in our, our think tank tonight, get a little reaction on this issue. I think it's an important issue. Joining us tonight, folks, there we've got uh, former senior homicide uh, prosecutor Bernarda Villalona joining us in New York, in Cleveland, Ohio, Ian Friedman, a criminal defense attorney, and of course, uh, a deputy public defender for L.A. County uh, out in L.A., Philip Dubé is with us. Great to see everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Bernarda, there, there's, this is, I'm not getting a clear picture when it comes to the citizen's arrest and what the McMichaels knew, what they should have known. Uh, where are you on all of this right now as, as we sit? I can tell you what is clear. When it comes to William Roddy Bryan, there's definitely no citizen's arrest in regards to his actions because you haven't heard anything about him saying that he believed that Ahmad Arbery had committed a crime, committed a felony, or any information about him in the past. So he's not going to be able to avail himself of citizen's arrest, and he has to focus as his self-defense, which I believe wasn't made out today. Regarding the McMichaels, regardless, with the citizen's arrest, it is clear that on that day, neither of the McMichaels observed Ahmad Arbery committing any crime. Because you heard from the testimony what Dad saw when he lifted his hat, head up, from doing the upholstery of the boat equipment or boat cushion, that he all he saw was Ahmad Arbery hauling ass strutting. And we know that his son was inside of the home. So neither of them saw him committing a crime. So in my opinion, at this point, we haven't heard the jury instructions. I don't think that citizen's arrest has been made out for either one of these three defendants. Ian Friedman, uh, your thoughts, because this is a significant issue for the defense, they have to be able to establish some level of a lawful attempted citizen's arrest. Otherwise, they're going down for felony murder. Yeah, so we've all obviously been in trials, and we all know that you have good days and bad days. And today was a good day uh, for the state, uh, not so good uh, for the defendants. Because here you have hard evidence that the jury's going to take back in that room. And they're going to say, well, wait a second, these guys they knew earlier on that 
you know, there wasn't any felony here, or if there was, that it couldn't have been, was not attributed to Ahmad. So it really is, is a tough day. What it's done is it has made sure that there is going to be uh, a debate uh, back in that jury room during the deliberation. But I would say uh, that at this moment, if the trial were to end today, all right, if it were to end today, uh, the defense has a very big problem uh, making out the citizen's arrest. I mean, clearly they didn't see it and they even had a discussion about it, which backs it up. So the deck is getting stacked against them daily. But again, let's see what happens to the rest of this trial. It's just not looking good for them at this moment. Philip Dubé, what I'm, what I'm seeing from, from this body cam footage, from the statements that are made afterwards, is that the McMichaels have this whole thing going on in their head. It's just in their heads, right? Somebody's on video. I had that gun stolen from my truck. Shouldn't have left it in the truck, by the way. And has to be the same person, and they're putting this together. But is that going to be enough to establish probable cause for a citizen's arrest? It just seems like they are jumping to conclusions in their own minds. No. You know what they have at most? They have a misguided hunch. And under the law, a hunch falls short of probable cause. It's certainly not clear and convincing evidence. It's just such a low standard that, you know, you don't get to pull out a gun and uh, detain and then shoot somebody. That's going to be their problem. Now, I will say, to be fair to Mr. Bryan, that... Um, if he truly believed that all he was doing was detaining somebody, I don't think he should be held liable for a felony murder. I think uh, merely being somebody in a car filming what's going on doesn't make him uh, an aider and a better to the underlying felony to hold him liable for the homicide, for the malice murder. I think that would be wholly unfair. And I think jurors would have a hard time uh, convicting him as well because, listen, they want to get the actual shooter. They want to get the people who had the actual intent to kill as opposed to somebody who just happened to be present. I want to bring back in Julie Janae right now because I want to talk about, uh, and, and, and it was mentioned, the guns that were drawn. Uh, the officer that night who responded on the 11th uh, drew his weapon, didn't he? And that became an issue today. He did draw his weapon, Officer Rash, and he had to answer it during the cross-examination when the defense attorney is really trying to make the comparison that the McMichaels had their guns when they were going after this person that they believed was responsible for break-ins. And the officer, 12 days before, was looking for this same person, same suspect in their minds, who did the same thing. Take a listen. They've been watching. They said unless he's jumped the fence and went over somewhere, they don't know if he's that he hasn't went on the road. So we just need to check everything. Stop right there. <clears throat> That's you. That is me. You got your flashlight in one hand and your police issued firearm in the other. Yes. Okay. Guns drawn. Yes, sir. Okay. The county police, everybody in here? Let me stop for a second. You got your gun drawn, but it's a burglary or trespassing. It's a property crime. So why is your gun drawn? I believe at that point then that we were notified. That's, I guess, dispatch had notified us that possibly armed. So it's for your protection. My protection. Not to hurt anybody. It's to protect you. Absolutely. In case somebody jumps down from the rafters we're looking at. Yes, sir. And surprises you. Yes, sir. You need to protect yourself. Yes, sir. You need to protect Officer Sherman. Yes, sir. You need to protect Greg McMichael, Travis McMichael, and Diego Perez, because they're in danger, too. Possibly. You don't know what's going to happen. I do not. But you don't take any chances. Not at all. You heard Robert Rubin there, the attorney for Travis McMichael, asking about a burglary. That word is one that the prosecution really uh, tried to object to inside of the courtroom, the use of the word intruder or burglar. And this witness, Officer Rash, did say that he had no reason to believe Arbery was a burglar because he would have to prove that there was intent to commit a felony when he went inside that dwelling in order to satisfy the Georgia statute. And he said he had no evidence of that, seeming like he doesn't have have any probable cause if he had truly been able to find and detain Arbery that night.
All right, Julie, can I stick by? Uh, when we come back, we're going to um, talk about Roddy Bryan. Apparently did a ride along with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. That officer testified today and they saw the video. That is next.